Welcome to the Daily Dispatch. First, we'll talk about the trade wars between US and China and the recent US move that blacklisted multiple Chinese AI and chip making companies. Next on the Dispatch, we'll update you about the ongoing war in Ukraine, where Ukraine has launched an offensive at the Russian annexed Donetsk region. And lastly, we're going to shed some light on the security trouble in East Asia, with North Korea firing another ballistic missile and Japan ramping up its security forces. We're here to give you the news and to help you infer the world around you. I'm Tayyaban Asar Khan, and here is your Daily Dispatch. The United States of America has added 36 Chinese companies to a trade blacklist, doubling down on the efforts to slow what it calls China's development of advanced chips and technologies for military uses. This move by the Commerce Department means that American companies will require to obtain licenses from the United States government to export the critical technologies to their Chinese customers. Now, besides this, the U.S. has also applied the foreign direct product to more than 20 entities barring the non-American companies from exporting products containing the U.S. technology to China. Now, the 36 companies put on a trade blacklist include the Yangtze Memory Technologies, also called the YMTC, which is China's largest memory chip producer. The U.S. has accused it of violating the U.S. export controls by diverting the supplies for military purposes in China. The U.S. Commerce Department has said that the move is aimed at restricting China's ability to leverage artificial intelligence advanced computing, and other commercially available technologies for the military modernization and human rights abuses. Now, China has condemned this move, calling it a blatant economic coercion, adding it will affect the bilateral trade relations. The Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson has said that the U.S. is stretching the concept of national security, abusing export control measures and politicizing and weaponizing economic and sci-tech issues. The recent move by the U.S. Commerce Department follows Biden administration's landmark bill, providing more than $50 billion in grants to boost and expand the semiconductor research and production in the U.S. While China is working to roll out a financial support package of $143 billion to support its semiconductor industry in a move to achieve certain self-sufficiency in chip making. These developments signal that technology is going to be one of the key elements of great power competition between the U.S. and China, whose relations have been marked by geopolitical rivalry and trade wars in parallel to their huge bilateral trade volume, crossing over $650 in 2021. Next, we'll tell you about East Asian geopolitics. North Korea has tested a high-thrust solid fuel motor in an attempt to develop a new intercontinental ballistic missile using the solid fuel. Now, Pyongyang has been trying to build solid fuel missiles to increase the survivability of its nuclear weapons. North Korea tested its first nuclear weapon in 2006, three years after withdrawing from the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Since then, it has carried out six nuclear tests and conducted several different missile tests to improve its delivery systems, including the intercontinental ballistic missiles, which some nuclear experts claim are capable of hitting the U.S. mainland. It has carried out a record number of missile tests this year, more than 60 so far. Now, North Korea defends its weapons development program against alleged external threats from the U.S. and its allies, South Korea and Japan. Seoul and Washington, on the other hand, accuse North Korea that it wants to invade South Korea, and its nuclear forces and missile developments threaten the regional peace and stability. Meanwhile, in another story on East Asia, Japan is working on three key security documents, likely to be approved by the cabinet soon, signaling a new defense posture by Tokyo. The national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and the defense force preparedness plan outlines Japan's defense posture in the region. The documents call for acquiring long-range Tomahawk missiles, which have a range of more than 1,000 kilometers capable of reaching the east coast of both China and Russia. It also plans to develop its own missile systems in the region, which has three nuclear-armed states. Japan is also planning to increase its military budget. It has justified the need for an increased military budget in the face of growing modernization of China's defense, as well as North Korean missile threats. After the World War II, Japan pursued a policy of what it calls the defense-only defense policy, restricting its defense spending to 1% of its GDP. But in recent years, Japan has been rethinking its defense posture, 
After the World War II, Japan pursued a policy of what it calls the defense-only defense policy, restricting its defense spending to 1% of its GDP. But in recent years, Japan has been rethinking its defense posture. As Japan prepares the next year's budget, its prime minister, Fumio Kishida, has already announced plans to increase the defense spending to an amount equivalent to 2% of the gross domestic product within the next five years from the traditional 1%. That would take Japan's annual defense budget to more than 80.55 billion US dollars, giving the country the world's third largest military budget after the United States and China at their current levels. In some updates from the war in Ukraine now, the Ukrainian forces shell the Donetsk region in what the mayor of the city has called the most massive strike since 2014. He said Ukrainian troops fired 40 rockets from the multiple launcher systems, hitting multiple targets, including the civilian infrastructure. Now Donetsk is one of the four regions that Russia annexed and proceeded to hold a referendum in September, which Ukraine and its allies denounced as a sham and coercive. The other three regions are Luhansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia. Despite the referendum, Donetsk is militarily contested between Russian and Ukrainian forces. Fierce battles were witnessed in the recent weeks in Donetsk, with control shifting with combat successes and failures between the military forces of Kyiv and Moscow. The Nets rocket attacks come in the wake of heavy fighting in the east and south of the country. Last month, Ukrainian forces recaptured the southern city of Kherson from the Russian forces. It had been under the Russian control since the war started in February 2022. It has also come under heavy shelling in the recent days by Russia, with rockets hitting energy infrastructure among the other targets. Now, the last few weeks have seen significant military developments in the Russia-Ukraine war, with two Ukrainian drone strikes hitting the Angles airbase which hosts the Russia's fleet of strategic bombers, while Russia's long-range missiles hit targets in Kyiv, including communications and energy infrastructure. Meanwhile, the U.S. is planning to supply Ukraine with Patriot missiles to counter the long-range missiles by Russia, which the latter calls legitimate targets if supplied to Ukraine. We'll also briefly wrap up some other headlines from around the world. Now let's take you to the story on the rising economic competition, where a review of the U.S. trade policies by the WTO, the World Trade Organization, is taking place in Geneva. China's ambassador to the World Trade Organization, Li Chenggang, stated that clearly the United States is a unilateral and bullying hegemonist. China has also called the U.S. a destroyer of the multilateral trading system and urged Washington to adhere to the WTO rules and safeguard the multilateral trading system. This comes on the back of China's initiating a dispute against the U.S. at the World Trade Organization after the U.S. curbed semiconductor exports to China, throttling its semiconductor industry. Other countries like China and Russia, as well as the European Union, have also criticized Washington's trade policies. Similarly, in a separate meeting in Brussels, the EU representatives focused on trade disputes with the U.S. The U.S.'s Buy American policy came under the critique for sidelining the European car companies in favor of US-made electric vehicles. The EU states have also raised concerns that this approach will violate the WTO tenets, and it's neither sustainable nor climate-friendly. The US continues to maintain that these are measures tied to the national security. The US ambassador said that they are confronting the new challenges and are adapting accordingly, which is their sovereign right. However, many believe that America First policies are building protectionist rhetoric and are contrary to the spirit of multilateralism and the open market. And of course, we have some more drama coming in from the internet's town square, Twitter. In latest news, Twitter suspended accounts of the range of senior journalists reporting on technology, particularly Twitter. High-profile journalists from CNN, The New York Times, Washington Post, and other news agencies who have covered Twitter recently in a critical manner were banned without warning on Thursday evening. Elon Musk has stated that these bans come as a result of these journalists doxing him, in effect revealing this real-time location. These news agencies have since hit back at Elon Musk, suggesting none of these journalists had shared his live location and were simply reporting on the account of a competing social media company, Mastodon, that Twitter had earlier suspended. It should be noted, Mastodon continues to allow posts that share the location of Musk's private jet on their platform. But this location data is already available online through publicly accessible flight records and does not reveal his exact real-time location. Since then, Elon Musk has tweeted out suggesting the bans or suspensions are only temporary. But with new controversies surrounding Twitter every day, 
It looks like the company's new CEO's claims of building a platform enabling free speech will continue to be under question. And lastly, the U.S. Central Command's chief, General Michael E. Carrilla, has hailed Pakistan's achievements in the fight against terrorism while meeting with the Pakistani Army Chief, General Asim Munir. Last week, the U.S. State Department spokesperson also stated that they remain committed to disregarding the terrorist outfits in Afghanistan, including the Tehreek e Taliban in Pakistan that pose a threat to them or their allies. Now, Pakistan had been a frontline ally of the U.S. during the war on terror. However, this relationship has often been marred by trust deficits and blame games. These statements from the CENTCOM chief comes as a positive development and suggests that the two sides are once again able to see eye to eye on counterterrorism challenges. However, Pakistan will continue to face challenges to its national security, with tensions between Afghanistan and Pakistan continuing, despite the expectations that the relationship will improve after the U.S. troop pullout last year. Now, the terrorist outfit TTP continues to operate from Afghan soil and continues to target Pakistani armed forces and civilians, existing as a challenge to the region and Pakistan security and souring relations between the two countries. Similarly, despite experts pointing to friendly ties between Pakistan and the current Afghan Taliban government, clashes at the border like the recent cross-border firing in the town of Chaman in Balochistan, Pakistan's western province, that led to one death and 15 Pakistani civilians being injured, will negatively affect bilateral relations necessary for the stability in the region. That's all, folks. We'd be happy to receive your feedback and suggestions. We'll be back tomorrow with more bite-sized news that keeps you up to date with what's going on in the country, the region, and the globe. I'm Tayyab Khan, and this was your Daily Dispatch.